Welcome to Angels in the Glen. Today's lesson is Daniel 9, part 4. And what we want to do is we want to set the stage so that we can answer a single question. What exactly happened at the end of the 2300 days? What exactly happened at the end of the 2300 evenings and mornings? Now, you know this. You've watched Daniel 8, parts 1, 2, and 3. You've watched Daniel 9, parts 1, 2, and 3. You understand that the 2300 evenings and mornings is the longest time prophecy in the Bible. And it's important for the church to understand this time prophecy because it's going to prepare the church with, in no uncertain terms, how close we are to Christ's soon return, and he wants his church ready. Take a look on the screen, and you'll see that we've broken this down into two-part answers. To answer the question of what exactly happened at the end of the 2300 evenings and mornings, we have to answer two questions. What exactly happened in heaven? And then what happened on earth? We'll explain to you in this session right here in, in part four why we need to answer both those questions. The answer to that question, what happened in heaven, will be in parts four and five. And then what happened on earth will fully explain that in Revelation 10 and 11. Let's go to the next screen so you can understand the context and the outline of what we're going to cover today. Daniel 8 verses 13 and 14. Let's go through this slowly. Verse 13, then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? Now you already know the vision talking about here, I've highlighted in red, that's the cod zone. And it's about the regular sacrifice. You know the regular sacrifice isn't the best translation. We've already talked about the best way to understand that is it's the daily, right? How long will the vision about the daily apply while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Now on the screen, you'll see I've underlined, triple underlined, holy place. It's so important that we truly understand what the holy place is and that it's properly restored, which means cleansed vindicated, made right again. So the outline you see right now, we need to answer the question, what is the holy place? We'll talk about the removal of the daily and the significance of it. We'll get some new information about that. And then we'll talk about the restoration framework. And it's so important, the restoration framework is critical to understand so that, because God wants his people ready for a soon return. As to the particulars of exactly what happened in heaven, we're gonna cover that in the next lesson in part five. This will all make sense as we come together. Let's open up in prayer. Father God, I just ask that you be with us right now, be with your church. May your Holy Spirit move upon all of us. May you enlighten us and may we be prepared for Christ's soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, back on the screen, I just wanna take a look at Daniel 8 verses 13 and 14 one more time. This is so critical to, for the church to understand. Those two verses right there that you're seeing on the screen, they're dense, they're powerful. There's an inordinate amount of truth that is going to come out of the scriptures as we unpack these verses right now. And in the same way that you know John 3.16, many of you know John 3.16. You can quote that by heart. You can explain it to someone. You can unpack that particular verse. We believe it's important that you're able to unpack these two verses and explain this to anyone. That's how important we see these two verses because, again, God is preparing his people for his soon return. Let's jump in and answer the question, what is the holy place? Now, on the screen, I've put various tr popular translations of the last part of Daniel 8.14. And I just want to underscore this. Look at the different translations. You've got holy place properly restored. You've got sanctuary cleansed. You've got sanctuary restored to its rightful state. You've got sanctuary cleansed again, reconsecrated temple made right again, and even the RSV, sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Here's the key that I want to underscore. It's talking about a holy place, a temple, a sanctuary, and something happened to it that put it in a state of disrepair, all right? Put it in a state of 
not right, but it needs to be made right. It needs to be cleansed. It needs to be in its proper state. And that's what happens at the end of the 2300 evenings and mornings. Now, a lot of people want to gravitate naturally toward the literal local. They want to say, oh, holy place, properly restored. That's the literal temple in Jerusalem. That needs to be restored. Now, that's an innocent, uh, innocent uh, understanding of it. It's not talking about a literal and local sanctuary or temple building structure that needs to be restored in literal local Jerusalem. That's not what these scriptures are talking about. It's talking about something much grander, and it's talking about the church. I want to do a little quick review here so that we make sure we properly distinguish between the literal and the spiritual. Take a look at the next screen. And this is the theme of the entire book of Daniel. Remember, we're unpacking this. We unpacked in Daniel 1 verses 1 and 2. That's the theme of Daniel, where King Nebuchadnezzar, he attacks the city. He takes Judah captive. The sanctuary is destroyed. The vessels are taken out and they go into Babylon captivity for 70 years. That's the framework to understand the book of Daniel in terms of end times of what happens to the church, which would be a spiritual worldwide application. And when I see spiritual application, I'm not talking about something that is intangible. It's just a concept. No, it's real. It's tangible. It's just the spiritual application. So just as King Nebuchadnezzar took Judah captive so and act as an antichrist before his conversion, so too the antichrist who would come in history would take the church captive and distort the truth. So that's the context there. Now, let's go through biblical verses to underscore what is the holy place so that it's very clear in no unclear terms. Go to Ephesians 2 verses 19 and 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Are you starting to see a picture here? You're seeing building, foundation, cornerstone. It's all talking about a structure. Verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a what? There it is, holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. You see, the holy temple is the church. Let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 3. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Talking about the church. Let's keep going. Go down, stay in 1 Corinthians. Just jump down to verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Now, I should note this real quick. In context, the temple of God here is the church writ large, right? You're going to see in 1 Corinthians 6, I'll put it up on the screen. It's talking about we too, as individuals, the Holy Spirit dwells within us and we're a temple. But here in this context, let's go back to the screen. In 316, it's talking about you, the church, are a temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Look at verse 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. Now, a lot of people think, oh, destroy the temple. If someone commits suicide, God will destroy him. That's a whole separate topic. Here it's talking about if anyone brings harm to the church, if someone causes division in the church, there is judgment going to be made on those. So the church is important to understand temple of God. Next verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 is now individuals. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not you own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God on your body. Let's keep going. Look at Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. In context, it's talking about Christ. It's talking about Christ, his body. The church is the body. Christ is the head. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You see, the church is the head. No, sorry. The Christ is the head and the church is the body. All right, we're connected. Ephesians 5, 23 
basically states that. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But I want to walk through Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 32. Notice this. Paul here is making a comparison between husbands and wives and Christ and the church. Let's pick it up. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Look at verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined to his wife, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now look what Paul says here. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. That's interesting. We've talked a little bit about this before. A lot of us think, whoa, mystery, marriage is a mystery, right? But he's talking about Christ and the church. That is, Christ became human. He put on human flesh. He's marrying the church. Right? Christ is the head. The church is the body. That's the mystery that God would so closely fellowship with us. He establishes the institution of marriage so that we can understand a grander picture of his love. Let's keep going. This is why it's so important. In fact, before we go to the next scripture, this is why it's so important. If someone persecutes the church on earth, they're attacking Christ in heaven. If someone persecutes the church on earth, they're attacking Christ in heaven. And the perfect example is given when Saul is on the road to Damascus. He's going to persecute Christians and pick it up in Acts 9 verses 3 to 5. As he was traveling, as Paul, Saul was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. This is important to understand. The church is inextricably connected to Christ. An attack on the church is attack on Christ. That's why he says, why are you persecuting me? All right, he feels it. He's the head. The church is the body. That's why it's so important that we understand the connection that we have with Christ Jesus in the church. A couple more scriptures and we're going to move on. Look at Hebrews 3, 6. Again, talking about we are his house, but Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. We're a holy temple. We're God's holy temple. He dwells within us by his Holy Spirit, not only collectively as a church, but also individually as, as individual church members. So I'm putting up on the screen so that there's no question about it. What is the holy place? It's the church on earth connected to Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. If you've got that, you now have a greater appreciation of Daniel 8 verses 13 and 14. Oh, one more thing I want to mention. Two more scripture verses because we need to make sure that we don't look to the earthly sanctuary, the earthly temple. We're looking to the heavenly and the church on earth, writ large, church global, worldwide. Look at Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. The author of Hebrews is saying, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, and to the general assembly and the church and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Key to understand that. Heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the church is enrolled in heaven. We're not physically there yet, but we're enrolled in heaven. We're connected to heavenly Jerusalem through Christ. All right. Pick it up back at the scripture verse and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Last scripture I want to share with you. The author of Hebrews is saying in this next verse that I'm going to show you, he's saying we've got to not look to a city that is not going to last, but something that is going to last, which is to come. Hebrews 3, 13 verses 13 and 14. So let us go 
to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. He's saying, no, 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 don't be looking to your literal, physical, geographic Jerusalem for the answers. Look to the heavenly, look to the city which is to come, and it's part of, it's connected to the church. All right, with that established, let's go back to our Mare Hadzon framework. On the screen, you see the Mare and the Hadzon. You understand the key to this because remember, the beginning of the Mare, the beginning of the Hadzon is a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. They both have the same starting point, 457. Now that's true. To re restore and rebuild Jerusalem was at 457. They were taken into captivity of Babylon. They came out. The decree was given in 457 and the city would be rebuilt. The temple would be rebuilt and it would be seven weeks and 62 weeks until Messiah comes. All right? But that same verse right there, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem would also talk about heavenly Jerusalem, which includes the church on earth. That's why it's so important to understand when you get to the very end of the, of the cod zone, it's talking about heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly sanctuary and the church on earth. Keep looking on the screen and I've put up when ancient Jerusalem and the sanctuary were destroyed. Just shortly after the end of the Mare, 70 AD, Titus, devastates and destroys the city and the sanctuary. We've covered that in previous lessons, all right? That's done with. When you get to the end of the 2300 evenings and mornings, it's talking about the church on earth, which is connected to Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now I've just overlaid ancient Jerusalem is literal and local, but the church on earth connected to Christ is spiritual and global. So the old covenant ended at the cross of Christ. When Christ died, resurrected, he institutes the new covenant. And so we have to be in the new covenant, not looking to the old, not looking to the literal local. We're in the new covenant, looking to heavenly Jerusalem. Okay. Can't underscore that point enough. I think you've got it. Now let's answer the question. Let's unpack this a little bit more. Let's talk about the daily, the removal of the daily. All right. Because this is what devastated this is, the, this is the most devastating thing that happened to the church. Now, I want to do a couple of slide reviews before we get into um, uh, the key verses about the daily. Look on the screen. What I've done is underscored and highlighted the verses that distinguish between the two vision that Daniel sees, the Cod Zone and the Mari. You can see it right there. I just recommend that you go ahead and make sure you mark your Bibles in chapter eight so that you know which is the cod zone, which is the Mari. And in today's world, you can download an app. I have Blue Letter Bible. There's a whole bunch of apps. You can check out the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the original Greek, what the words are. It's right there. You verify it. I'm, I'm just putting up here so that you can, I can foster you because as you highlight in your Bible, the scriptures will come alive to you when you understand the differences between those two visions. Okay, so I put that up there. Let's keep moving. Remember, Daniel 8, 26, this is the key right here. And the vision, which is part of the evenings and mornings, which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret for it pertains to many days in the future. And the key is the mare is part of the whole, part of the 2300 evenings and mornings. And on the next slide, we know what the mare was. We've already explained that it's the vision of a mighty man, a man who has the ability to fight. And it ends with the death of the prince of princes, which is the cross of Christ. But the cod zone goes on even further and it goes all the way down to the time of the end. Now let's unpack the key elements of the Mari and cod zone. This is just a quick review. I want to, I want to really get to the daily on the screen. Mari is part of the evenings and mornings and you have the Mari, the elements of the Mari is the ram, the goat, the little horn, which has its horizontal conquest and the prince is broken. Now on the screen, you see no guessing. Ram is Medo-Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome, and the prince is broken, Jesus Christ. So that's the Mari. And what are the elements of the cod zone? You have a little horn, a vertical. You have stars fall, trampled, given to the horn, equal to the commander of the host. The little horn makes itself equal to the commander of the host, and it removes the daily. All right, on the screen, you already know it, right? Little horn, church date system. Stars fall, trampled, given to the horn, host is taken captive. That's God's people. That's God's church. Equal to the commander of hosts is equal to Jesus. 
Now it says it removes the daily. Let's unpack this a little bit more. I've left it blank right there because I want to talk about this. Now on the next screen, I've put up Daniel 8 verses 11 through 14. Let's walk through this slowly because I really want you to understand this. Verse 11, it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. This is that little horn power going a vertical on a vertical conquest, religious conquest. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host and it removed the regular sacrifice. There it is. The better translation is the daily. You see on the screen, regular sacrifice, regular sacrifice, regular sacrifice, three times. It's emphasizing this in just these few verses. So it removed the daily from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. It's important to understand this on the screen. I've underlined removed in this sense. It's also can mean lifted up. It lifted up the daily from him and the place I've underscored it is Macon. That's the Hebrew word for foundation. So and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. I've underscored that. I want you to get the picture now. So it makes itself equal to the commander host and it lifted up the daily from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down, lifted up, thrown down, lifted up, thrown down. Let's keep reading verse 12. And on account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. So there's the captivity along with the daily and it will fling truth to the ground and performance will and prosper. Verse 13, then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that one particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision, the cod zone, how long the, will the cod zone apply about the regular sacrifice, about the daily, while the transgression causes horror so as to allow the, both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place would properly restored. What we need to do is we need to understand and underscore what is the foundation? Because he lifts up the daily lifts up and the place and the foundation of his sanctuary was thrown down, lifts up place foundation thrown down. What is the foundation of what is the, what is the foundation of his sanctuary? You already know the answer. Let's, let's just pull up a couple scripture verses so you can see this on the screen. Psalms 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of thy throne. Loving kindness and truth go before thee. Psalms 33, 14, from his dwelling place, that's from his dwelling place, from his foundation, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. Psalms 97, 2, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Or you might say, I'm still unsure what the foundation of his throne is. Think about this. If God sits in the most holy place, right? We've talked about this. Go back to the blue stone study. If you need to, I'm going to pull up a blue stone study slide, uh, right here shortly in a second, but think about this, the foundation of God's throne. If he's in the most holy place and his presence is above the cherubim and he sits on the mercy seat, what's in the mercy seat or what's, what's below the mercy seat, the Ark of the covenant. What's in the Ark of the covenant. That's right. 10 commandments, right? The, that's the foundation of his throne. That's the foundation of his sanctuary. That's the foundation of the entire universe. Look on the screen. And we'll take a look at one slide from the Bluestone study. If you haven't gone through the Bluestone study, highly recommend you go back to it. So you really understand the significance because here's the Exodus pattern. Just as there was a bronze altar, this I'm, I'm talking about the sanctuary system, bronze altar, bronze labor. Then you have a holy place and most holy place. That pattern was revealed in the Exodus from Passover through the Red Sea to God's dwelling place. Remember Exodus 24 and under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself under his feet foundation move to the holy place. Most holy place. You have a foundation on his throne. It's the Ark of the covenant, which holds and contains the 10 commandments. That's the key to understand the daily. It removed, it lifted up the daily and the foundation of his sanctuary was thrown down. You see the daily is the law of God, All right? That's the foundation of his sanctuary, but it goes even deeper than that. The, the, it's the law of God. But if you take away the law, you take away the gospel, right? 
You can't have the gospel without the law. Think about this. Christ came to the earth to die for men's sins. All right, sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law. And the wages of sin is death in Romans 6. All right, so Christ comes because the law says, if you transgress it, you must die. So by Christ coming and placing himself and sacrificing himself on the cross, which is the gospel, he fulfills the law. He fulfills the penalty and payment for sin because the law says the wages of sin is death. He upholds the law by coming to the earth and dying on the cross. So if you take away the law, you take away the gospel. And the gospel is the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it goes deeper further than that. It's not just the law that was lifted up and thrown down. The gospel was lifted up and thrown down. But what did Christ do when he came to fulfill the gospel? He inaugurates the new covenant, right? He inaugurates the new covenant, which is, in effect, it's the eternal covenant before the foundation of the world. So lifting up the law and throwing it down also has ramifications for the gospel, has ramifications for the eternal covenant, which is what? The new covenant. God would write his law upon our hearts. No longer is it on tables of stone, but it's on the tables of our hearts. Because it says in the new covenant, I will write my laws upon their hearts and they will all know me. See, the Christian experience is to know God to know God, to know his character, to know who he is. And he reveals that to us by placing his law within us because it's a law of love, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you shall love others as yourself. See, it's not about this list of do's and don'ts. And yes, it's packaged like that, but the law goes deeper. It's a law of love. That's why they say, they will all know me, that I'm a God of love. That's why it's important. I don't have this on the screen, but... John 17, 3 says this, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God and in Jesus Christ you have sent. Do you see how Hebrews, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 10 is talking about that they may know you, that they may know you. This is eternal life that we would know him. He writes his law upon our hearts. So we're talking about the new covenant, the eternal covenant. Think about this, lifts up the daily, throws it down. Lifts up the law of God, throws it down. Lifts up the gospel, lifts up the new covenant, the eternal covenant, throws it down. Goes even deeper. If that's happening with the daily, right? If that's happening with the daily, that means that that, that little horn power is taking the word of God, right? Is not the law of God part of the word of God? Is not the gospel part of the word of God? Is not the new covenant, the eternal covenant, part of the word of God? Yeah, he's taking the Bible. He's taking the word of God, lifting it up and throwing it down. But if he does that, who is the word? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jump down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's lifting up and throwing down the ministry of Christ. We need the ministry of Christ in our lives. We need his intercessory mediation as an advocate for us. He's in the heavenly sanctuary and he's in there for us. That's why it's so important to understand the daily. The daily is the law of God, the gospel of God, the new covenant, the eternal covenant, the word of God, Christ himself. That's the devastating effect that this little horn power had against the church on the screen. Let's lay this out so you really understand what happens. I've got Daniel 2 laid out on the screen. You already know this. This is a review. Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly of thigh, belly of bronze, thighs, bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Right there, you see it. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe. Rome continues all the way to the end because you have feet of iron and clay. Now let's overlay the Mari and the Hod zone. Now let's talk about what happens after the cross of Christ, essentially. I mean, the gospel starts to go to the world, goes to the Gentiles, but then what happens under Rome's authority? Christians start to get persecuted and they get persecuted. And you know what? 
they're realizing these people don't even love their lives. They're willing to die for the gospel. They're willing to die for Christ. They say something's going on here. Eventually, over time, and even just after Diocletian, this persecution of 10 years, one of the worst in the history of the Christian church, Constantine comes on the scene. Now, I'll put it up on the screen now. Constantine comes on the scene, and he realizes in 312 AD, he says, there might be something to this Christianity. I mean, he believes that he, that he was given victory at Milvian Bridge. And he says, you know what? I think it's important that we be benevolent to Christians. So he issues the Edict of Milan in 313, and basically that's what it does. Be benevolent to Christians. We shouldn't persecute them anymore. And he even gets involved in a church council in 325, which we talked about before. And he believes that Christianity could be the way to rule his vast empire, right? How do you, how do you keep organization and structure around the vast Roman empire that has different cultures, different languages, free men, slaves, rich, poor, different languages, everything, Christianity, it transcends them all. He says, there's something to this. He looks at the organization of the church. He says, there's really something to this. So he starts to embrace Christianity, not necessarily because he believes the gospel, but because he knows it will help him retain power and structure and organization for the Roman Empire. And so by the time you get to 380 AD, you've got the Edict of Thessalonica. Christianity is now the official state religion. 380 AD. Before, they, Rome used to be polytheistic. They would worship many gods. Now they're saying, nope, one god, Christian god. Amazing. It even goes further on the screen. By 429 AD, the Theodosian Law Code comes together, which is essentially orthodoxy. But in it is laws against heretics, meaning there is one way to believe, one way to come to Christ, and if you don't follow this certain way, according to the legal authority that they put, the laws in place, then you were considered a heretic. And that would lead ultimately on the screen to the captivity of God's people and would manifest itself in this church state system in the Middle Ages. And I've got on the screen in May 7th, 538, this would be the reestablishment of old church laws and passing of new ones. What happened was that's when the daily was lifted up and thrown down. Because what essentially happened, in a nutshell, we'd have to do a separate session to cover all the doctrines of the Bible that were usurped and obscured and replaced by traditions of men. That's essentially what happens. All right, the daily, when you take away the law of God, the gospel of God, the new covenant, the eternal covenant, the word of God, you obscure it, the ministry of Jesus Christ, you have a big mess on your hands. And that's what you had during the church day system of the Middle Ages. Confusion. It's considered Babylon. All right. But the saints of God were in that system. Don't misinterpret me. The system was corrupt because that daily was removed by the little horn. Let's keep going. In fact, I want to point this out. The little horn of Daniel 7 is the same as the small horn of Daniel 8. Now here on the screen, I've got it right there. You've got Daniel 2, Daniel 7. Remember, successive world kingdoms, they all follow the same pattern, except you just have a lion, a bear, a leopard, a beast, and those 10 horns. But notice with those 10 horns, a little horn comes up. Key scriptures to point out, Daniel 7 verse 8. This horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boast. Verse 21 in Daniel 7, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Verse 25, he, the little horn, will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. Right there, times and in law. Lifts up the daily, lifts up the law, God throws it down. And during the church day system of the Middle Ages, they, it would change the law of God. That's why it's so important that we know our Bibles. All right, so take a look at any doctrine in any denomination of any church in Christianity across the world and see if it lines up with the Bible. Because I'm telling you, the church state system of the Middle Ages corrupted, obscured, and there's still traditions of men being practiced in the church today, writ large. That's why we know, need to examine the scriptures ourselves and know what the Bible says. Now, back on the screen, that's the church date system of the Middle Ages. The daily was lifted up and thrown down. So Daniel 7, the little horn, is the same as the small horn of Daniel 8. 
no difference. We're just getting different details and descriptions. Now watch this. Now that you know what the holy place is, the church, now you can properly understand other scriptures in the Bible. And I just want to show you one to see how it really comes alive. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. Let's unpack this. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, in a nutshell, what he's saying is people started saying the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord has come. He says, no, 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 no. Day of the Lord hasn't come yet. And here he qualifies it in verse three. He says, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come, meaning the day of the Lord, meaning the second return of Christ, the coming of Christ. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now think about this. Unless it will not come until the apostasy comes first. Apostasy means falling away. Falling away from what? Falling away from the apostolic gospel. When I say the apostolic gospel, the, the gospel preached and taught by the apostles. The law of God, the word of God, the apostasy is falling away from the word of God. Daily, lifted up, thrown down, right? Law, obscured. Gospel, obscured. New covenant, eternal covenant, obscured. Word of God, obscured modified, changed ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, obscured. That's what happened. That's the apostasy falling away. Keep going back to the verse and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay. The man of lawlessness is revealed. Think about this. If the man of lawlessness is revealed, that means he was hidden or not disclosed or in a place where we couldn't really discern what was going on. Now we know. Now we know, looking back, the man of lawlessness is revealed, right? Eyes like the eyes of a man, a mouth uttering great boasts, speak out against the most high. All of that talking about this man of lawlessness who sat at the head of this church date system back on the screen, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as God. Notice on the screen, temple of God. What is the temple of God? It's not a physical structure per se, right? The temple of God is God's church on earth. He displays himself in a prominent position in the church on earth as being God. Now, you know, on the screen, temple of God is the church on earth connected to Christ in heaven. In fact, I'm giving you a foretaste of what we're going to study when we get to Revelation, not Revelation, sorry, Daniel 11. On the screen, I'm showing you Daniel 11, verse 36. It's talking about the same man of lawlessness, this little horn power. Verse 36, then the king will do as he pleases and he will exalt and magnify himself above every God. That king there in the context little horn power who has eyes like the eyes of a man mouth speaking great boasts speaking out against the most high taking God's people captive. He will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods and he will prosper. He will prosper until the indignation is finished for that, which is decreed will be done. I'm just giving you a foretaste of what we're going to see. Now let's start to tie this together on the screen. You've got the Mare Hadzon framework. Remember, you are to discern from the issue of decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the side of the prince. It applies to literal physical Jerusalem at the decree to restore in 457, but it also applies to the end of the Hadzon at the end of the 2300 days. The holy place will be properly restored. And why would it need to be properly restored? On the screen. Because that church date system, the Middle Ages, would take the church captive and it removes the daily, removes the word of God, removes the gospel, the law, the new covenant, the eternal covenant, and subverts the ministry of Christ. So if it does that to the church, that means that the church would be in defilement. 
it would be in a state of disrepair. And now the church needs to be restored. Now watch this. Let's talk about now the restoration framework. We're going to bring this to a close right now. This is the most powerful framework I can give you to explain to you what is happening in terms of this restoration. Now, remember on the screen, what is the holy place? The church on earth connected to Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Very clear. If that's the case, which we've emphasized several times in this, in this video right now, what exactly happened at the end of the 2300 evenings and mornings? Well, if the church on earth is connected to, to Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, we have to ask ourselves a question, what happened in heaven and what happened on earth? So two things happen in terms of the holy place will be properly stored. What does that mean? What happened in heaven? What happened on earth? And in part five, we're going to answer what happened in heaven, but notice this framework. And John, the gospel of John, I should say, John chapter two gives us a little clue in terms of the restoration process. You may say John chapter two, that's not prophetic. Well, take a look at this verse. John two nineteen. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it in three days. Now we know Jesus was talking about his own body, but they didn't understand that. They were thinking literal local. How is it possible? This is a, this is a massive structure here. Beautiful, magnificent three days. I don't think so. Now notice this was a foretelling of the prophetic about the church. Look on the screen. I put the Mari Hadzone framework there. Look at the very end when the church date system ends in 1798 and look at when the cod zone ends in 1844. What's the difference? I've put the math up on the screen. You see it 46 years, 46 year difference. All right. So a restoration is, go, is, is taking place from the time that the church age system ends in 1798 and the time where it says at the end of the 2300 evenings, mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. All right. Here's the framework. What I want you to understand before I put up this framework is the fact that the pattern of literal physical captivity of Jerusalem, of Judah, taken captive to Babylon, and then after 70 years returning is the pattern for us to understand the church being taken captive to Babylon and then coming out of Babylon and being restored to, in a sense, heavenly Jerusalem. Watch this. Look at this graphic right here. Here's the framework and we'll end on this framework right here. You see the Mari Hadzone framework, right? The Mari, the Hadzone, the church state system, the middle ages, and then 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place were properly stored. Let's go all the way back to the captivity in Jerusalem, right? Judah's taken captive. Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. Now I've put 603 dates there, 605, 597, 586, because King Nebuchadnezzar essentially makes three attacks. And it's not until 586 that actually the temple is leveled, the walls are torn, everything's done, gone away away. But the captivity begins in 605 BC. Now, 70 years, you do the math, you come to 535. Now, at 535, Cyrus essentially decrees, you can go and rebuild, not Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. All right, so they're being restored. They're coming out of Babylon and God is bringing his people back, but it wouldn't be until 457 BC that the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem would occur. All right, Jerusalem, you need magistrates, governors, city officials so that they can properly run the city. And that was the decree that began the restoration of the city, even though the temple was already rebuilt. And that would set off a chain reaction on the screen. It was seven weeks and 62 weeks until Messiah, the Prince. So I'm going to put on the screen, look at this restoration of Jerusalem begins in 457 BC. And it would, what, what it would result, the restoration of Jerusalem, seven weeks, 60 weeks, it would bring the Messiah. So that's the first coming of the Messiah right there. Now watch how the pattern applies against spiritual Israel and the church. Notice when the church is taken captive, 538 AD, that's when times and laws are changed. The church is taken captive. We know what just happened. The daily was removed. Law, gospel, truth, obscured, thrown down. Ministry of Christ subverted. Now, if you, that time, times, and half a time, that's the 1260 years. Now, I don't have it up on the screen, but mathematically, 
That's a factor of 18. If you take 70 years and multiply it by 18, you get 1260 years. So it's a multiple factor. And we'll talk about more about the numbers in our Daniel 12 study. But right now, I just want you to see in the same pattern, church is taken captive. They're taken captive for a specific period of time. And then what happens? At the end of the 2300 evening and mornings, you hear the decree to restore the holy place, restore that it's properly restored. And then you know what the next element is. If the restoration of the holy place, which is the church on earth connected to the heavenly sanctuary, Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, then it's pointing to what? On the screen, second coming of Christ. Beautiful pattern there. We know we're getting very close to the literal, physical, audible return of Jesus Christ because he's going to pick up his church and take them to heavenly Jerusalem and forever we will be with the Lord at that point in time. That's the framework right there. All right, very important framework to understand. That's why it's, an, it's so important to understand these two verses, Daniel 8, Daniel 8, verses 13 and 14. A lot to unpack here. Now, last thing I want to say is we still haven't identified what exactly happened in heaven. All right, that's what we're going to answer in part five. And we'll make it in very clear terms. You're going to see exactly what happened in heaven. And this is setting the stage because when we move through Daniel 10, 11, 12, and then we get to Revelation 10 and 11, you'll see exactly what happened on earth. That's the pattern. That's the framework. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that when we dig deep into the Bible, we can understand your prophetic picture. And you're telling us that you're about to return. You're restoring us. Truths that were lost are being found. Truths that were obscured. New light is coming into the church and we're starting to see the pattern that you're coming soon. I just pray that you move upon everyone here that they would be inspired and encouraged that you're coming soon and that they would understand, that they would diligently study, that you would give them insight. We need your spirit to understand these scriptures. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, be sure Click on the link below, like to subscribe. Go ahead, download those study guides. We've got it all written out for you. We've got the charts. We've got the explanations. As you study this out, think about how you would share this with others because Christ is coming soon. We want you to be prepared. God wants his church to be prepared. Very exciting times. We'll see you next time.